Yeah, please, please do that. Posted on Georgia View for you for the uh, for the next uh, unit. You're going to be reading um, about <clears throat> the transatlantic slave trade. Um, you'll be looking at arguments uh, for and against, uh, written mostly by written entirely by white Britons um, this time. Right? So we're going to be looking at the perspective of a black British man next week. <coughs> But I just want to quickly show you what's here. Um, so I've got um, a link to a PBS documentary, which um, it's specifically about slavery in the Americas. But one thing we have to remember is that particularly in the 18th century, um, America and Britain are still very closely connected. Um, there are a couple of podcasts, uh, one on slavery and its relationship to empire, one on the abolitionist and member of parliament, William Wilberforce. Um, another on the Zong Massacre, which will be described in Thomas Clarkson's piece. Um, and there is also a uh, BBC radio play uh, about the Zong incident um, that you might want to give a listen to. Uh, but <clears throat> the first thing that I want to uh, really discuss today is the vocab quizzes that y'all took over the weekend. Uh, so first off, particularly given that like this was the first one, um, y'all did pretty well, right? But there are just a couple of things I want to clarify, and I do also just want to quickly go over the terms with you, because remember, part of the idea here is reinforcements. I want y'all to be able to remember these uh, for the midterm and then for the final. So first off, a little bit of clarification about uh, what I want on these quizzes. So I want the name of the relevant text, right? And I also want the author of that text, even if you have named the text and the author before, right? And even if maybe like we only read one thing that week and there's only one thing it can be. I just want you to be constantly making these kinds of connections. Now, I want you also to be specific, like when, I get, when you're giving me the name of the relevant text and the author of that text, some of you were giving me uh, the names of texts that I mentioned but we didn't actually have to read for the course. That was fine, I didn't take points off for that this time. But in the future, I want you to connect these directly to a course text, right? Even if I mentioned another text that these terms come from, I want you to be thinking about how they're connected to a text that you actually read for this course, um, and to give me that text and explain the connection rather than um, the text that's actually taken from. Right? Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. And I do also then want to see a brief but detailed. definition of the term. This part there was relatively little confusion on. All right, so let's just quickly go over the terms and just make sure everybody's got it. Okay, so first, horror. Do you remember what horror meant? The type of text for all the supernatural events and ongoings are meant to be perceived as Yes, it's a version of the Gothic, right? In which supernatural events are meant to be taken as real. 
And what course text might we connect that to? Monk. Yeah, the monk is one, right? We could also connect this to Coleridge's review of the monk, right? Or to the uh, Aiken and Aiken essay on the objects of terror, right? I would have accepted any of those. Women's March to Versailles. What was this? And what text do we connect? It was the march by women to the palace of Versailles about the lack and prices of bread. Uh huh. And then they over, not over food, but they like forced the family in the court out to Paris. Absolutely correct. And what text did we connect this to? It was first reflections on their personal friends? Yes, very good. All right, this one tripped a couple of people up. Uh, gothic follies. What are gothic follies? They were like fake medieval structures built on the grounds of rich people during the time period. Yeah, exactly. Right? The, yeah, these buildings that are meant to look exotic or meant to look old but are actually new constructions built on the grounds of wealthy estates. And there are a couple of texts that you might connect this to, but the one that I really had in mind was Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Man, right? where she talks about this near the end, about how these Gothic follies take up space that could be used for, oh, I don't know, growing food. That you know, land that could be used for the benefit of all is instead used for the amusement of a few wealthy people. Right? All right. Sensibility. What was sensibility? This is going to come up again today. You're thinking along the right lines here, right? Yeah. So sensibility is your receptivity to sense impressions, right? And the idea was that someone of great sensibility could use that sensibility and the sympathy that it engenders with other people to then develop, you know, benevolence, right? You know, kindness and generosity uh, towards other people. So, can anybody connect this to a text? Um, Burke's text, I would say. Uh, I always forget the whole. Reflections on the Revolution in France. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, we, we, we could, yeah, we could probably connect this to Burke, right? Because Burke is trying to elicit your sympathy for the King and Queen of France uh, through his kind of lurid descriptions of the violence they endured and his description of the Queen as a beautiful creature descending to the earth, right? Um, you could also probably uh, discuss the ter in terms of any of the readings on the Gothic, right? Back to the Gothic, female Gothic. What was female about them? Where women's virtue has come in on the Yeah, these are these, the Gothic texts in which a woman's virtue is compromised or threatened, usually by an older man, right? Um, any text we could connect this to? The monk. Okay, the monk. Right, we have Ambrosio threatening Antonia, right? We can also connect this to Burke, right? You know, the Burke's depiction of 
the scene in Versailles, where the peasants are attacking the bed, right? And the queen flees uh, in, in a threat of her life and virtue. Um, this is also kind of female gothic kind of scene, right? All right, sublime. What is the sublime? Aesthetics of awe and terror, right? So things that are kind of like too big or too frightening for our brain to take in, right? Things that make us feel tiny, weak, insignificant. Um, can we connect it to a text? Okay, yeah, Burke is using the aesthetics of the sublime. And also, it's opposite the beautiful. To make his arguments about the revolution, right? So the beautiful, right, is you know that you know, the aesthetic of desirability, right? The beautiful is something that you want. The sublime is something that you um, that you are you know in awe of or terrified of, right? And both of these terms come from uh, Burke's own aesthetic philosophy. All right, what about the male Gothic? Do we all remember what the male Gothic was? The female Gothic was about a woman trying to protect her threatened virtue. What was the male Gothic about? It's a female character who refuses to be put down by the bonds of society. Yeah, it's like a, the monk is a good example of this as well. Right? You have you know, this character, Ambrosio, whose internal desires are in conflict with society's expectations for him. And so he tries to kind of bust out of those bonds um, in ways that are not exactly entirely appropriate or um, uh, beneficial for himself or others. Right? All right, uh, last two, Marie Antoinette. Do we remember Marie? She was the last queen of France before the revolution. Before, before the French Revolution. Yep, last queen of France before the revolution. Ends the revolution about a foot shorter than she began it. And um, what else makes her relevant to any of the particular course texts? Apart from the fact that she happens to be Queen of France during the Revolution. I actually just mentioned this a minute ago. Exactly, yeah. So Burke is using her to show how beautiful and aesthetically pleasing the old aristocratic society is, right? And contrasting that with the violent bloodthirstiness of the market woman. All right, good. Um, and last one, terror. All right, we started with horror, we end with terror. supernatural events that happen that always have some kind of scientific explanation at the end of the day. Yeah, in a novel of terror or a tale of terror, all of the supernatural events 
can be explained rationally in some way. Right? So at the end, everything all just kind of wraps up neatly. Right? So while the tale of horror is meant to shock the reader emotionally, right? The tale of terror is only supposed to provide the kind of pleasing suspense that then ends with a sense of closure when the mystery is solved, right? So the text you would probably attach this to is the Aiken and Aiken, right? Okay, so any questions about the vocab quizzes? Okay, and again, right, you'll have another 12 of these as well, right? So you, you, if, um, if you didn't do as well as you would have liked, uh, there's plenty of opportunity to make this up. All right, so what did you think of the poems that I had you read for today? How'd these go for you? It was very insightful look at a way that war can bring upon that real destruction, not only within like buildings and the staff of society, but also to the individual, especially during this time. Okay. Can you can you uh, can you bring that to a specific example? You know, like um, within the discharged soldier, the way okay. he walks in uh -huh. to the situation, it's um, it's presenting this beauty, this silence that has come out of war, and then when he sees the soldier, it presents like almost this ghastly like vision or yeah, ghastly sight uh -huh. of someone who has been torn down yeah by war who has been through these things. Uh huh. So. Okay, so yeah, so yeah, the, the physical description of the soldier coming into the silent landscape, right? Mm -hmm. I think one thing to note about the landscape here too is like, um, what's unique about Britain that insulates it in some ways from the worst destructive excesses of war? It's surrounded by the water. Yeah, see. yeah, it's an island, right? Mm -hmm. So much of the fight, really all of the fighting that's going on in this period is going on in continental Europe. There's also some fighting going on in Asia and some fighting going on in the Caribbean. Right? One thing that we have to remember here is that this is actually a global conflict because Britain and France have global empires, right? And in fact, you know, there are consequences uh, for U.S. history of all of this as well. Right? So, anybody know who the Louisiana Purchase was? Who's the Purchase of that territory, territory of Louisiana from the French, I believe? Yeah, and Louisiana covered a much bigger area than our, um, in fact, like much of the territory immediately west of the Mississippi was part of the Louisiana Territory. But yeah, we bought that Je Thomas Jefferson's government bought that from, <coughs> from Napoleon Bonaparte, essentially. Right? War of 1812. Are you familiar with that uh, little engagement in history at all? Maybe not. The War of 1812 was pretty short and was kind of inconsequential. <laughs> But you know, essentially, like, like about you know, 30 years after the American Revolution, we get into a war with Britain again because the British are capturing American ships and impressing American sailors into their navy to go fight the French, right? So this conflict, even though the United States is not really a part of it, right? it has implications for us because one, we're buying territory from the French so that Napoleon can fund his campaigns in Europe. And we're at odds with the British about, you know, shall we say strong arm recruiting tactics. Anything else about these, these poems that struck you or that interested you? One of the things, by the way, Colin, that got me on that tangent is where the sailors, the, the soldier says he's come from, right? He's come from fighting in the tropics, right? So he's come from the Caribbean. Yeah. 
else here that really grabbed you? Really got you thinking? Well, in the discharge soldier, when the speaker was talking, then we made like, oh, I got there, and then I was just sit back. And he just kind of tore it like, like, he tore it like it's back, like he had no emotion to it. Okay, yeah. Like, yeah, the soldier is given this kind of flat affect, right? Mm -hmm. That, yeah, that there's not much emotional involvement in this tale, right? And figures like this would actually have been pretty common in Brit like in England or throughout Britain in the late 18th century and early 19th century, right? There were lots of soldiers who couldn't fight anymore, um, whether because of injuries or because of disease or whatever, right? Just going to be wandering about with nothing to do. And in fact, what's the speaker in the poem's first response to the sight of the soldier? What does he initially do when he sees the soldier? Turn to page 746. Uh, the first couple lines. We get somebody to read starting from While well, Thus I Wandered. While well, Thus I Wandered, Sir Oxford led on a chance a sudden turning of the road presented to my view an uncalled ship. So near that, looking back into the shade of a big tall door, I could not him well myself unseen. Okay, we'd stop there, right? So what does he do when he sees the soldier? He hides, yeah. This is actually not, for 1798, an especially unreasonable response. Right? There's a soldier, or a guy in a soldier's uniform anyway, just hanging out by a mile marker in the road, not doing anything obvious, right? But, the figure of the discharged soldier is often associated with crime and banditry in the late 18th century imagination, right? Because very little provision was made for these men when they came home. So many ended up turning um, to crime to support themselves. So yeah, so his fear, when he hides himself behind the hawthorn, is that this guy is a bandit, right? That this is someone who means to harm him and rob him. So anything else you guys picked up out of these three poems uh, before I go any further with this stuff? It's a list of names you read in the newspaper, right? right? And if it's not someone you know, right, that's, you know, the speaker's first inclination is like, okay, this wasn't a name I recognized, so my eyes just kind of glossed over it, right? But I think one of the things that the victory is pointing out is uh, the Napoleonic Wars. Which run from roughly 1793 to 1815, so it's about uh, almost a whole generation um, kind of under the shadow of the war with France. Um, but these are wars that are, dis this is a war that's discussed in the public sphere much more vigorously 
than a lot of past wars were, right? So does anybody recall from last time, we started talking about this idea, and we said we're going to pick it up today, this idea of the public sphere. Does anybody remember what the public sphere is? What do you mean by this term? The public sphere kind of describes like everyday work out about um, the everyday person rather than home life and everything like that. In contrast. Yeah, so we, yeah, we are talking about like ordinary people going out and doing things in public, right? So in public spaces. But a lot of these public spaces that we talk about in the public sphere are really ideological spaces or literary spaces rather than physical spaces, right? So this is a term that's coined by the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas. And for Habermas, what the public sphere is, is space for public participation in debates on issues of consequence. Right? Whether they're political issues, whether they're um, military issues, aesthetic issues, whatever. Right? The public sphere um, is that space that is granted to the public in order to comment on civic life. Right? And this is something that doesn't really exist in Europe prior to the 18th century. Right? Most of this kind of stuff was conducted above ordinary people's heads by elites, right? But there are a number of changes in 18th century Europe that bring this into being, right? So one, I think we've already mentioned this is mass literacy, right? For example, a lot of the debate over the French Revolution, which we were talking about last time, was conducted by people publishing boring pamphlets. Right, so Burke published his pamphlet in response to a guy named Richard Price. Mary Wollstonecraft published her pamphlet in response to Burke, and so on and so forth. Right? So you'll have these people just kind of like quickly printing these polemics, arguing for or against different posi positions, and distributing them um, throughout the population. And so on the one hand, yeah, this leads to these kind of pamphlet wars, there's also an explosive growth in newspapers. Right? This is the era in which the newspaper as we know it really kind of comes into being. Given, you know, not only the you know that there's an audience now a literate audience for newspapers, but the printing technology has become quite cheap. You also have the growth of what are called corresponding societies. And these are groups of people with uh, similar interests um, or similar goals um, who write letters to each other. Um, in order to advocate for particular causes, right? We'll get a little bit more into this when we talk about Ola, Ola Uda Equiano uh, next week, because he was involved in several important 18th century corresponding societies. But in addition to mass literacy contributing to the creation of the public sphere, you also have urbanization. Right? More people are moving for various reasons, into cities. Which is not only putting them into closer contact you know, with the great and powerful, but it also means that you know, they require um, you know, gathering places. So <clears throat> whereas you know, people out in the country would like gather on the village green as they did their work, right? 
You get people in cities instead gathering in new coffee houses. And these coffee houses contribute to a culture of you know, kind of vigorous scientific and political debate. Right? People go to coffee houses not just to get a caffeine buzz on, but also for intellectual stimulation of various sorts. So as the Napoleonic Wars are being fought, people are following them in newspapers. Right? They're following the movements of troops. They're looking at published lists of people who died in particular battles. Right? They're looking at maps of places where these battles are being fought. Right? So this is a war that really kind of invades print culture in a big way. And we'll get to this in a minute as well, but it also um, ends up reshaping the British built landscape in a lot of ways. But yeah, so what you're pointing out, Grace, in the Southey column, is an example of how the way people think about war is changing as a result of print culture, right? And I think that, you know, it, it's interesting. let's actually look at this poem for a second, because it's not very long, the victory. Can I get somebody to start reading for us on page 751 with heart, how the church bells thunder in harmony? Heart. How the church bells thunder in harmony stuns the glad ear. Tidings of joy have come, good tidings of great joy. Two gallant ships met on the element, they met, they fought a desperate fight. Good tidings of great joy. Old England triumphed, yet another day of glory for the ruler of the waves. For those who fell, was in their country's cause. They have their passing paragraphs of praise. And are forgotten. Okay, let's pause here for a second. We have this first little verse paragraph here. And I think, what's the overall tone of the beginning of the poem? Joyful. Joyful, yeah. It's a celebration, right? What, what, what things make, what sounds or what images make this appear joyful at first? Church bells. Oh, yeah, we got the church bells. Good. What else about this seems joyful or celebratory? It keeps repeating great tidings of great joy. Yes, good tidings of great joy, right? So good news, right? Good news, everybody. Right, the news has just come over. We won a great battle at sea, right? Is there anything... Um, in this first verse paragraph that seems a little bit off, though, from this whole this kind of notion of joy and celebration. Is there anything that seems to kind of like get in the way of that or interrupt it? She brings up people who died. Yeah, and at first, right, it's, for those who fell, it was in their country's cause. They have their passing paragraphs of praise, right? So, so on the, there's consolation at first, right? Like, well, they died for Britain, right? They died for England. But then, yeah, the next, those next two lines seem to undermine this celebratory idea of it, right? They have their passing paragraphs of praise and are forgotten, right? They get their little lines in print, and then nobody's going to remember. Now, I think we also, there are a couple of things we need to think about here as well. What kind of battle is being described here? It's a sea battle, right? So it's between ships, right? Yeah, this is a naval battle. How are the church, how's the sound of the church bells described? Thundering, yeah. Now, how might the sound of like, a thundering sound be related to a naval battle? The ocean might sound like thunder. Okay, the roar of the ocean, right? Like, if they're doing a naval battle, they probably got some 
the knees growing <laughs> each other. Okay. <laughs> and what do we call those things? The fire <laughs> great big <laughs> missiles. <laughs> Well, let's, let's think about it this way. Like, how does the poor bastard the poem is talking about die? If you look on page 752, right? Suddenly it came, and merciful the ball of death, for it came suddenly and shattered him, and left no moment's agonizing thought on those he loved so well. So what does he get hit by? Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's the word you were looking for. Yeah. yeah, so the thundering, right? The thundering church bells kind of recall the sound of cannons, right? And the thundering, the church bells' thundering harmony stuns the gladiator, right? Do we, do we tend to think of ourselves as being stunned by joy or celebration? Yeah, if you're, what's that? Not typically, yeah. Like being stunned is, you know, like usually the result of violence in some way, right? So yeah, so the thundering. We use the word stun, right? Already suggest here to us that things aren't quite um, as happy and pleasant. as they might appear on the surface here, right? And this kind of prepares us then for those two lines that deflate the victory party a little bit. Can I get somebody to continue reading from There was one who died in that day's glory. There was one who died in that day's glory, whose obscure name and how he stored his faithful chronicle. Peace to his honest soul. I read his name, twas in the list of slaughter, and blessed with God the sound was not familiar to my ear. But it was told me after that this man was one whom lawful violence had forced from his own home and life and little ones, who by his labor lived, that he was one whose uncorrupted heart could keenly feel a husband's love, a father's anxiousness, that from the wages of his toil he fed the distant dear ones, and would talk of them at midnight would be trod the silent day, with him he valued, talk of them, of joys that he had known, of oh God. And of the hour when they should meet again, till his full heart, his manly heart, at last would overflow, even like a child with very tenderness. Peace to his honest spirit. Suddenly it came, and the merciful, merciful the ball of death, for it came suddenly and shattered him, and left no moment's agonizing thought of, on those he loved so well. Okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> what do we get then in this first paragraph? What happens here? Sorry, a little his loved ones? Okay, yeah, the uh, right, the, the dead man is thinking of his loved ones while he's on the ship, you know, when he gets whacked by the cannonball, right? But from the speaker's perspective, and thus from the reader's perspective, what's happening over the course of this first paragraph. He's like distracted himself from like what he's doing or seeing by remembering his family. And then like mm -hmm. it almost like it seemed out of nowhere. Like he was so distracted he didn't realize what was happening. Uh-huh. I mean, yeah. Well and we might also be able to relate this to the situation by which the guys brought into the Navy in the first place, right? What are we told about how this this, this poor bastard enlisted? He was like forced to go into it. Yeah. He is a victim of a practice called impressment. Right? It was not uncommon at the time, nor was it illegal, for um, what were called press gangs to go around um, through, you know, through towns and on the waters and to simply uh, grab able-bodied young men and put them in a uniform and say, you're in the Navy now, son, you know? Um, no particular choice about it. Now, there were also, particularly in the earlier stages of the war, uh, one of the most familiar sounds was the recruiter's drum. You would have recruiting sergeants 
who would walk through villages beating a drum. Two words. Then kind of what like uh, they were empowered to offer these kind of sign-on bonuses to men who might want to enlist. So I'm going to show you um, a cartoon from the era. That is a kind of satirical take on this whole process. So the cartoon is drawn by an artist by the name of James Gilray. And it's called John Bull's Progress. It's in four panels. So John Bull, in the Romantic period, is supposed to be this kind of representative Englishman, right? You know, he's a, you know, he lives in the country, has a wife and kids, he's you know, kind of like, you know, middling prosperous, um, stout in figure, and, you know, staunch and a little conservative in his opinion, his opinions. So, the first panel here, we have John Bull happy, right? And what do we see here in this panel? What does happiness consist of? Necessities. Yeah. He's got everything he needs here, right? He's got his little jug of beer. He's got a nice roaring fire. The daughter is in the kitchen, you know, bringing in the milk pail. The wife is um, spinning yarn behind him, right? And. What do they have apart from necessities here? Each other and a happy family. Yeah, it's a happy family. And apparently, like, they're prosperous enough that they can even afford, you know, they got pets. Right? They got a dog, a cat, the two little boys are playing with a bird. They can afford a clock. Various, you know, decorative candlesticks and whatnot, right? So here, John Bull is at home, at peace, in the bosom of his family, and relatively prosperous, right? And then in the next panel, we have John Bull going to the wars. And what do we see about, like, how do we see him relating to his family here? He really got his back against him. He doesn't seem to really like, care. I think he was a very strong Yeah, the family's trying, they're physically trying to restrain him, right? Trying to pull him back. But, you know, he's got his uniform, he's got his gun, and he's off marching with the regiments. Now, panel three is John Bull's property in danger, right? So what's happened now that John Bull is no longer at home? They can't include all the materialistic things they have to do? Yeah. This sign here it's a pawnbroker, right? So they have to pawn all of their possessions. And in the final panel, John Bull's glorious return. And how are both John Bull and the family changed here now? What's that? Okay. Yeah, everybody looks older, right? What else has changed about them physically? They look like they have an aging Yeah, every time Yeah, everybody's emaciated and malnourished, right? Including John Bull, right? We've come a long way from fat and happy here in the first panel. Right? He's also missing a Yeah. Yeah, he's missing a leg, he's missing an eye, his uniform's tattered, right? So what seems to be the basic argument of this series of drawings? Happiness. You can't get happiness out of war, I guess. Okay. War can destroy 
yeah, I mean, what we have here is the destruction of the whole family, right? Not just John Bull, and not just the family, right? But without John Bull's labor, without his income, the family can't survive, right? And going off to fight, you know, he is exposed to all sorts of physical dangers and diseases that leave him a physical wreck as well, right? So the argument here, yes, yeah, seems to be of you know, war as a destroyer of and underminer of the British family, right? And I think the reason I point this out is because I think Southey in the victory is making a similar argument, right? That because this guy was pressed into the Navy and killed by a cannonball in a naval battle, right? It doesn't matter to his widow and children that it was a glorious victory for England, right? What matters to them is that Papa's not coming home, right? What matters to them is the, you know, the loss of this individual and also the economic support that he brought, right? So we haven't talked at all about the Anna Letitia Barbold poem. And I do want to look at that a little bit before I give you all maybe a little bit more context for all of this. What did you all think of this poem? 1811. We have actually met Anna Letitia Barbold before, but under her maiden name. She was Anna Letitia Aiken when she co-wrote that essay on the objects of terror uh, with her brother John. But Barbold is her maiden name. So um, just to, to tell you a little bit about this poem, this was the last poem that Anna Letitia Barbald ever published. She was in her late 60s, and it was so savagely received by reviewers that while she didn't stop writing, she did stop publishing her work. So do you see anything in this poem that might have made people so angry that they would bully an elderly woman into not publishing poetry anymore. Okay, uh, so what in here kind of comes off as bashing? Um, well, I, I kind of like how she started off by calling it the loud death drum. Uh -huh. Just immediately right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's not just a drum, it's a loud death drum. Yeah. There's, there's this steady drum beat of world war, right? You know, one kind of like recalls the drums that follow armies, right? That you know used to keep marching men in line. But also the recruiting sergeant's drums that are being heard in towns throughout Europe, right? Not just in England. What else about this seems to you to be anti-war in spirit? Let's look at these two verse paragraphs. Are we going to say something, Colin? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, uh, I was looking for but uh, uh -huh. around 45, yeah. 45 to 50, it's kind of talking about how England has to share in that guilt of war and the woe that other people are facing. Okay. And just celebrate. Okay, so yeah, but let's let, yeah, let's start from like around line 39 there, where this first paragraph begins, because I think that kind of sets that up, right? But, and thinks thou Britain still to sit at ease, an island queen amidst thy subject seas, while the vexed billows in their distant roar but soothe thy slumbers and but kiss thy shore, to sport in wars while danger keeps aloof, thy grassy turf unbruised by hostile hoof, so sing thy flatterers, but Britain know 
Thou who hast shared the guilt must share the woe. What's she talking about here? Possibly how the queen and the people of Martin were just have the luxury of perfect crafts and relaxation. It's just people out there dying. Maybe. Well, maybe if we think about this in terms of Britain's special geographical situation again, right? The Napoleonic Wars are not being fought on British soil. They're being fought primarily at sea and across the European continent, right? So, for example, the, uh, the piece of music that I played for you at the beginning of class, uh, Beethoven's Third Symphony, Symphony of the Eroica, was actually dedicated to Napoleon Bonaparte. But Beethoven uh, withdrew that dedication um, after Napoleon's brutal rampage across Central Europe, um, in which he laid a siege to Vienna, where Beethoven happened to be living, right? And he kind of witnessed the human toll of all that. So is Barbald here suggesting that anybody in England has to directly witness the human toll of war? Don't have to witness the destruction of the land, don't have to witness the killing of the people, right? Because it's all happening someplace else. But then what is she, um, what do you think she means by that line that uh, Colin pointed out to us a moment ago? Thou who has shared the guilt must share the woe. that what's the what's the message that Barbal is sending to her fellow Britons here? Part of like sharing the consequences of war that have been brought upon even if even if the soul is untouched there's still untold consequences that aren't always seen. Uh-huh. And if Britain contributed to starting the war, right, then it is eventually going to come home to their shores, right? And indeed, like, um, during this period, um, the government was kind of in so much dread of French invasion, right? You know, this, this, there was this idea that French invasion was an imminent possibility. They actually built these elaborate fortic fortifications. They're called Martello Towers. Uh, they look like this. They're these kind of squat, round towers. Once this comes to light for us. Um, they're always on the coast. They're intended to like, kind of keep a watch on the sea. But you see them in particular um, along the southeast coast of England, that, you know, that which is closest to France. And you see a lot of them in eastern Ireland as well. You also weirdly see several surviving examples in Canada, which, as we know, in the early 19th century was still part of the British sphere of England. So yeah, these squat little round towers go up all over the place. And if we look at the end of Aiken's poem here, or the end of the excerpt, it's not actually the end of the poem. She says, yes, thou must droop, thy mightest dream is over. The golden tide of commerce leaves thy shore leaves thee to prove the alternate ills that haunt enfeebling luxury and ghastly want. Leaves thee, perhaps, to visit distant lands and deal the gifts of heaven with equal hands. So what does she seem to be predicting here at the end of the poem? What does she think is going to happen 
to bread. But once the war, once war actually hits their land, it's going to tumble down because they don't have the protection of that sea and the navy force. Uh huh. Why is she talking about this stuff in economic terms? Or she talks about commerce. She talks about enfeebling luxury, dealing the gifts of the gifts of heaven with equal hands. What's going to happen to all that British wealth? It's going to be distributed to other great countries and areas. Yeah, it's going to get distributed elsewhere, right? It, <clears throat> Deal the gifts of heaven with equal hands, or that invisible hand that Adam Smith argued guides the economy, right? Is going to guide all that economic activity elsewhere. Because Britain's going to go kaput. So, Barbold's poem is an example of what is called a juvenilian satire. Now, this is not to be confused with a juvenile satire, which would uh, you know, be something that would appeal only to small children and be a bunch of jokes about poop and underpants. A juvenile satire is, how do, how do, how do I want to define this? Um, a juvenile satire is one that presents the speaker as a moralist railing against a corrupt society. Right, so the speaker or the perspective figure in a juvenile satire is looking at the culture in which he or she lives and pointing out its moral flaws, right? And the big moral flaw that she seems to see in her own culture here is a kind of complacency about war, right? People are following the war in the paper, they're reading all about it, right? but acting like you can't touch them. And the weird thing about all this is that this French invasion never actually does come to pass. And the British built environment after the Napoleonic Wars, apart from these defensive structures that never, that never ended up being necessary, looks a lot more like this. We have all these monuments that are built to heroes of the war, like the Admiral Horatio Nelson. For whom a uh, spiced rum that is basically the same thing as Captain Morgan, but is slightly cheaper, is also made. And here is a bronze statue of the Greek hero Achilles dedicated to Arthur Wellesley, the first Duke of Wellington. Who defeated Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo. This is an arch devoted to Wellington as well. This is another Wellington monument. And this is the Wellington monument in Phoenix Park in Dublin. Uh, Dublin is the city where uh, Wellington happened to be born. So what do you all notice about these monuments that go up to these war heroes? They are very, very large. And there are six Wellington monuments just in the city of London. 
plus all over the rest of the UK, right? Anything else you notice about these monuments? up into the heavens, right? There's also, in most of them, uh, kind of Greek and Roman influence, right? There's kind of classical influence that we see in most of these. Um, and there's no blood and guts in any of them, right? It's very much a kind of idealized picture of war heroism. I mean, here, you know, they've got Admiral Nelson up there because he's kind of, you can't really see it from here because he's sitting on a great big coil of rope like you find in a ship. Um, you know, the Wellington monuments, I should say, Wellington himself doesn't even appear on the monuments. They're just these kind of, you know, perfect classical forms. But what I want you to think about is ways in which this kind of representation of war is at odds with the representation of the Napoleonic Wars that we saw in these poems, right? So give that some thought, give that some consideration. And next time we're going to be moving on to talking about uh, the transatlantic slave trade. So let me give you the guide questions for the Clarkson, Coleridge, and Calvin readings. I hadn't actually intended for you to have read things that were all C's next time, it just worked out that way.